Welcome to r slash Entitled People, where we share stories from your lives about people who think the rules don't apply to them and they should get what they want. Thank you friends for subscribing to the channel and for so many likes. And today we have three great stories, so subscribe, hit the like button and here we go. The first story, this truck is not for sale. The second story, woman demands immediate service, citing a plane needs to be caught. She leaves with her time wasted, and we were all glad to be rid of her. The third story. The security guard suspects the president of the bank of robbing this bank, and he is praised for it. The first story is... Entitled kid tries to steal my antique truck, goes to jail. I've recently come into the possession of a 1947 international pickup truck, a monster of a four-wheel drive that looks fantastic now that I've cleaned it up and changed the fluids even has the original black diamond inline six-cylinder engine. Not bad for a barn find. Gorgeous old truck and very desirable, as I have come to find out. Now that it's all legal, I've begun driving it regularly and often find myself getting waved and honked at and even asked to pull over a couple of times so someone could have a look at it. I'm constantly getting offers for it as well. It's not for sale, never will be. It's my most treasured possession already, and I plan at showing it off at different truck rallies and get-togethers. This incident took place at a local gas station slash convenience store. It started off pretty much a normal day. I've gotten used to the honks and staring already. Nothing unusual when you own an unusual vehicle to me. I pulled into a local 7-Eleven to get gas and a snack. Hadn't had breakfast yet that day, and went in, got myself a breakfast burrito, and paid for gas, and when I stepped out and made my way back to my truck, I found some teenagers sitting behind the wheel of my truck, looking as if he was trying to drive it. I yelled before I got to my truck for the kid to get out, it's not his truck. When I got to it he still hadn't moved and said, this truck is so cool, wanna sail it? It's not for sale kid, now get out before I yank you out of it. But everything is for sale and I want it. You're not getting it, it isn't for sale and opened the door at which the kid suddenly bolted and ran off. Kids these days, I muttered to myself, thinking the matter was over. Boy was I wrong. I had just filled the tank and went back and got my change, taking time to lock the doors, this time before going back in and coming back out. When I got out, back to my truck, there stood the kid with an adult next to him. He said, my son wants this truck, hand it over now. Not going to happen, and if you don't back off of a truck you're not getting I'm calling the sheriff and making you back off. You're giving us that truck or we're taking it. I simply pulled out my cell phone and started dialing the non-emergency number, at which the man went white and said, hey now, I was just kidding, you want to sell it. I told him already, points at the kid, it's not for sale and won't be, now I suggest you be gone before the sheriff arrives. They were suddenly gone, but that isn't the end of the matter yet. The sheriff arrived, I described the incident to him, and they checked the security cameras outside on the store, but there wasn't much they could do without having seen the incident, or having witnesses willing to talk to them. So I went on about my day, doing some shopping at the local Wally World and stopping at a local specialty parts shop to order some parts for the truck that specializes in classic and antique vehicles and headed home. I got home and for a few hours everything was fine. I had however parked my truck in a secured garage on my property, as I usually do to keep the truck out of the weather and considering what happened earlier, good thing too, because as I found out, these two were not done trying to get my truck. Late that evening just as I hit the bed, I heard some unusual noises around the garage. I looked out and saw two figures prowling about the garage, first trying a security window, then trying to pull the garage doors open. So I snuck out my back door with a shotgun in hand, rounds loaded with rock salt and pork rinds, very painful, but not deadly unless at near point blank range. I load my own shotgun and rifle rounds. Briefly rock salt, when forced into the skin, produces an intense burning sensation, and pork rinds glue themselves to human flesh, as if super glued to it and must be forcibly peeled away without the appropriate solvents. Extremely painful either way. Next thing these two heard was a ka-chunk of a shotgun's round being loaded into a shotgun chamber and froze. Then a quiet but firm voice, on the ground, now, both of you, shortly before were on their faces, hands behind the back of their head, and they lay there until the sheriff arrived. Sheriff arrived, I lay my shotgun aside as they demanded and accepted being cuffed for the time being. They yanked the two off the ground none too gently, and pulled them over to the cruiser they arrived in. They questioned me and took off the cuffs, after taking possession of the shotgun temporarily, and questioned them separately. I told my side of it making special note that I believed they were after my antique truck, and told them of the earlier incidences that day. 
They had the unmitigated gall to claim I had stolen their truck and had it stashed in the garage, and they were just trying to get it back. When asked, I produced the title and registration of the truck and even let them into the garage so they could run the plates. All came back as registered to me and me alone. I had the fun of giving these two a brilliant smile and a wave goodbye as they were driven off and taken to jail. Court date pending at this point. We'll update when I have more info, but may be limited on what I can post here. I got my shotgun back after proving it was mine and having to reclaim it from the department, but no big deal. They're still in jail at this point charged with trespass, attempted theft, attempted auto theft and several other charges. I was there for their initial appearance and when the judge asked if there was any objection to them being stuck, I of course objected. Yes, I was being vindictive. I stated they wanted my truck so badly they snuck onto my property at night to try to steal it. I fear if they're released, they'll try again. A small addendum. For those reading my story that intend to create shotgun loads as I have, be careful. Even though the rounds are not considered lethal, you can still easily blind someone if the round hits them on the face, and they can still be lethal at close or point blank range. The second story is… I guess planes would wait for their passengers in those days. This is a story that takes place during my retail days in the big blue box. A lady comes up to our counter and says she wanted RAM installed. I quoted her the price for the RAM and the install. Don't remember the price of the hardware, but likely expensive since it was DDR and the service was $40. First she has a hissy fit over the fact that we had the audacity to charge for our labor. The usual but it's so easy for you guys and whatnot. I explained to her that while cumbersome, her laptop is designed to be opened and she can easily do it herself if she wanted, but either way it takes time. This being aside from the fact that if we screw up and break something, we're basically going to have to give her a new machine, so she had better pay something to us. Either way, she was going to have to pay. I guess when she heard the term time, she decided to complain about something else and wanted to know how long it would take us. Even though I can have it installed and tested in under 10 minutes, there were other people in line and other people that had quick work ahead of her. So I quoted within an hour. Standard at the time was 24 hours, but I was being realistic. She pitched yet another hissy fit about how she can't wait for that and she has to catch a plane. I offered to let her come back later next week and I'd make sure she was priced the same price for the RAM should it be marked a different price when she got back and she started going on about how she needed it before she left. I told her we couldn't do it that moment. We have a line that once we clear it down we'll be able to get it done. Evidently that was the wrong answer. She finally demands the manager. I told her that's fine, but until paperwork and payment are rendered, I can't start, so it will only increase the wait time. She was fuming when the manager came by, so he took her to customer service to yell. At this point, she had to already wait 5 minutes for him to just get there. After about 20 minutes, we get the line down, and I spend another 15 minutes getting simple hardware installs done. I think it was a network card and two other RAM installs. Nothing difficult, but if driver's fight or a case is designed to take 587 screws to access the slot, it can take a bit. Since I've already finished what needed my immediate attention, I decide to take care of other duties while my coworkers handle the other machines. I go over to customer service to pick up returns to be tested, and lo and behold she's still there reaming out the manager. I get a deliciously petty idea in my head, and now that it took root, I had to do it. I pass him by, make sure to tell him quite audibly, hey, I finished off with the front counter machines, I'm going to grab and start testing these since there isn't anything else for me to do right now. She may have been smart enough to know what I was alluding to. While she's glaring at me, I look her straight in the eye and say in my most concerned and clearly unable to pick up on social cues customer service voice, if you've been there you know what I'm talking about. What are you still doing here? Didn't you have to go catch a plane? The look she gave the manager could have melted stone and he looked at me like wildly coyote right before he gets hit by a train. He later told me about how much he wishes he could throw me into a volcano and we all had a good laugh. He also mentioned how she just kept going on about missing her flight for this. You know, the one over the service she didn't want to pay for, to install the hardware she didn't buy, that she waited for the manager to complain about, then willingly opted to complain about for 40 minutes, instead of actually catch her flight. All of which of course automatically made him not believe a word she said, given there was nothing holding her there, and she could have left at any time. And the last story is… I am the bank president, Jack A. This was back in the 70s when I was in the military. I was stationed outside Little Rock, Arkansas and found I was in need of extra cash, so I got a job at a security company working overnight. Our cast of characters are Me, obviously, SP1, first suspect, SP2, second suspect, PO1, first police officer, PO2, second police officer. There were three of us who worked security at a prominent downtown bank, one for day shift, one for swing shift, and one overnight. I was the swing shift guard. 
On the job, we had time clocks we had to punch in on, in different areas showing we were patrolling. There was one revolver for the three of us, and I found out it was not in working order. Not only dirty and a plugged up barrel, but the cylinder wouldn't rotate. But it didn't matter, for the ammo inside had turned green making it unusable. So it was my third night. I had just taken over from the older daylight guard, and started I making my rounds with my privately owned weapon, and cleaning the duty weapon between patrols. When I finished cleaning and putting in new ammo, I carried it along with mine. The daylight guard didn't pass any information on, and didn't write anything in the log, so I figured nothing out of the ordinary. One of the time clocks was in the main lobby behind the cashier's cage. When I entered the lobby, I noticed the vault was open, a light on, and some muffled speaking from inside. So I called for the police and proceeded to the vault with both guns in hand. Me. Hands up and they better be empty. They put their hands up and slowly turned to me. They were in casual attire, had cash and books out, plus a good sized hand tote next to them. SP1. What the heck do you think you're doing? Do you know who I am? Me. It appears you're stealing money and you're a thief. SP1. You idiot, I'm Mr. Insert Name, the bank president. We're doing an audit. Me. Got identification to prove that? Now, this was before lanyards and many weren't issued IDs, proving their identities or where they work. SP1. Uh, not on me. My coat's inside my office. I can go get it. Me. Nope. You gentlemen walk out to the lobby, sit down, and keep your hands up until the police show up. You could see the anger in SP1's face, and SP2 was shaking so hard. I could have sworn the building was shaking. A minute later, two cops ran in from where the security office was. They had a key for that door, and PO1 asked what was going on. I told him my story, while PO2 went to handcuff the suspects. PO2. Dad? PO1. You recognize one? PO2. Yeah, my father. Hey, Barney Fife. You detained the bank president? What the hell did you think you were doing? Me. Uh, stopping a bank robbery? I meekly said. SP2 then pulled out a government ID with a badge indicating he was an auditor. He was still shaking and was so nervous he couldn't speak. The officers helped them up while I was apologizing, and SP1 said they had to do a night audit, for apparently there was some cash missing, and they were checking the books along with the cash on hand, to find who had taken the cash, or just messed up in the books. Feeling stupid, I went back to my patrolling, then wrote the incident in the daily log. The next day I found a memo for me to come to the company office, 8th floor of the bank building and speak with the manager of the company. I thought, this is it, I'm getting chewed out and canned. To my surprise, SP1 had commended me for my diligence, my observations and the way I had handled things. The manager gave me a pat on the back for my work. Anyway, I think it wasn't my fault. There wasn't anything in the log and there should have been. The official service weapon wasn't maintained, and the ammunition was a joke. It was like I was the only one that took the job seriously. I hope you love these stories. Don't forget to subscribe if you want to know when the new video comes out.